Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSB Magazine. Every company has a story to tell, from the small startup to the large enterprise, and everything in between. This is one of them. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Marco. John. It's, uh... It's time to repeat the future. It's the future we, of the future. We did the last future so good. Let's, uh, let's repeat it. When is the future? The yesterday. Question. There you go. <laughs> right there. You know, yesterday I was there like, when is tomorrow? And then, you know, it's already there. Go figure. <laughs> That's right. And this happened a lot in technology and daydreaming? security. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dreaming on a better future. You know, that's why my, my uh, column yes. is redefining society. But, you know, now we deal with what the reality of things is, which is, yes. it's a good reality. Well, the cool thing is we can control our future uh, as long as we take action. And you can only take action if you know what you need to take action on and think about it a little bit. And, of course, the, the world of cybersecurity uh, at home and in the office, it's blending and becoming more complex and and we need help, right? Uh, as businesses, as security leaders, as the people working from home, we need help. And uh, that's why our good friends at Black Cloak exist to, to help identify the risks and mitigate those risks and, and uh, repeat the future that we actually want, right? And not, talking not about somebody, that we... <laughs> Sean, talking about yeah. somebody that has predicted the future a little bit, uh -huh. right? I know. I know. This guy here. Let's, let's introduce him. <laughs> Chris. Hey guys, how you doing? It's good to be. It's good to be back with you, uh, Marco, Sean. Always good to be here. Always good. And you brought a friend. I did. I did. Um, I, I your your audience knows me um, uh, knows me well, but uh, but actually for today's conversation, uh, I wanted to make sure we brought in our our chief information security officer, uh, uh, Daniel Floyd. Uh, you know, so, you know, 20 years worth, over 20 years worth of uh, you know, a whole bunch of things, system architecture, security architecture, security operations, all the rest. And uh, and I think a two or three times CISO now. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to actually pass it over to him. Let him kind of introduce himself to this audience, this community. Everyone knows me as the CEO, founder of Black Cloak. But Danny, uh, go ahead and go ahead and tell the people who you are. Yeah, well, it's great. It's great to be here. Yeah. So Daniel Floyd, I'm the, the CISO here at Black Cloak. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I started my career in systems architecture, did about a decade of network admin, sysadmin, and then, you know, really got into uh, cybersecurity, passion really around pen testing, penetration testing, exploiting networks and home networks in particular. Uh, and then, you know, more recently, I've been the uh, focused on doing the more executive side of things uh, as a CISO here at Black Cloak. So it's great to be here. Very cool, Chris. And what's what have you been up to? Um, oh, yeah. I, I mentioned we've been talking about this venture before it was even a reality. You know, I made the joke about predicting the future, and now all of a sudden, you know, I know you guys are doing super good, and uh, it's kind of like, wow, thank God that somebody thought about it. <laughs> so, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, you know, so so to in, reintroduce the topic, I mean, we are digital executive protection. Black Cloak protects your corporate executives, your high profile individuals, your board, your executive leadership team, those 50, 75, 100, 200 people at the company that are the, the, the people that really have a uh, larger tax surface than everyone else, except the nuance uh, you know, and you guys knew this early on. I mean, literally early on sitting on a sofa with me <laughs> back in the day uh, before anyone else knew what we were going to do. Uh, the nuance of it is this, not inside the four walls of the company. You already got all that covered. You got plenty of great products and technologies and things that you can leverage to protect the inside of the company. Black Cloak is digital executive protection for the outside, for the other 12 hours a day. For that, that cannot be controlled or, or uh, protected by the CISO, by the team, by the folks there. We're protecting their privacy, their homes, their devices, their peace of mind in their personal life. And when I say them, I mean the executives and their family, husband, wife, spouse, kids, significant other, that whole enclave so that it really forms a hardened target around them. And man, I mean, since, you know, it's like the past few months, have we got stories and now a lot of the stories are public. 
Um, but it's super exciting, you know, predicting the future, showing and telling the story of what we wanted to do, what we were seeing. And, and now we're here. And I think everyone sees this and is like, huh, that's a risk we need to go ahead and take control of. So, Daniel, what the future is now, right? So, so wh where are we sitting? What, what, what's the reality that uh, executives are having to deal with, such as yourself, yeah. even? <laughs> yeah. So, what you know, we just saw in you know very recently um, in in uh, a very high profile breach that may have occurred with a certain password management company. Uh, you know, the the home networks are the targets. We're seeing again. The home network is the entry point for threat actors to gain access to corporate devices, corporate secrets, and pivot into the corporate infrastructure. So the, the, the four walls of the perimeter, the old moat and castle design and network security design is, is a thing of the past, right? We have our entire C-suite, high access employees, high privilege employees are, are all working from home. They're remote desking they're working from you know all over the world really and their their traditional network security and, and four walls doesn't does not work anymore and we're, we're seeing that the personal devices personal networks are in play from a threat actor perspective and it's definitely a, a valid attack surface that we're seeing more and more get hit and what are you hearing from from some of your peers that uh, have experienced this or or knows either you've either had it or know somebody who has right? one of those things. Um, what are some of the stories you're hearing from from folks you chat with? Uh, it's, sorry, say that. It's, what are some of the stories that we're hearing from? That you're hearing from some of your peers that uh, that have experienced or know somebody who has experienced this. Uh, well, yeah. So uh, the, you know, obviously, the the biggest concern that we're hearing is the the traditional model of of knowing where your assets are, knowing what your assets are that you have to secure goes out the window when it comes down to your employees working from home. You know, every home is what I call kind of a snowflake. Even when you can, you can baseline across your corporate infrastructure, you know the types of devices that your executive team, senior leadership team is using. As soon as they go home, that home network, you have 10 executives Every one of their their home setups is a complete snowflake, and what 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 I'm hearing from you know peer industry you know peers in the industry is how do we handle that right like I, it's hard enough having to figure out how to do asset control for the ten offices we have and how do I extrapolate that out for every single employee and know that employee A has this type of setup or this type of equipment and be concerned about what's being what the attack surface is at those homes versus what employee B, employee C, or, you know, high privileged access employees have across those different attack surfaces. And then also you have the, the their concerns really are what can I access and what what's the right level of separation of privacy and church and state between those employees and you know, what level of visibility am I even permitted to have? So it's really a, it's a problem of kind of the fundamentals of IT security and being able to do, you know, asset documentation and understanding what even is at their homes. And I think that's it. I love that you said this because I was going to go to Chris with kind of recapping that concept that we discussed many times on how you drew a line when it comes to the company checking on you, which is what Daniel just said, and how you always said you kind of you need a third party company that take care of that. So a little refresh on that approach for those that haven't had this story before. Yeah, so think about it this way. I mean, every single every single employee has a healthcare, right? The company decided are they going with you know Yamana or Blue Cross, whatever it is. They decided what what plan they're going with and all the rest. They provide that to employees. A healthy, happy employee population, even executive team population, might have the Mayo Clinic, whoop de doo physicals, and extra special, you know, air care there. But they've decided that they want healthy employees, that the health and wellness there in their personal life will transcend back into the company, right? If the CFO is not dropping dead because of a heart attack or a stroke, then you're going to have a much better corporate plan and corporate vision. But that you have to have a shim that you can't do it yourself. You, the company, can't actually have your own pool of doctors that you employ to go to their homes and do that. 
It's got to be separated. Same thing on the cyber side. And we've seen this model in terms of physical security, in terms of uh, healthcare, in terms of a number of different things. And so we basically took that same model that says, hey, your executives are being targeted. Nobody cares as a hacker or a nation state. Nobody cares that they're in their personal life. It's even better, even easier to hack them there. Instead of $100 million worth of cybersecurity, we get $5 of cybersecurity we have to contend with. And so what we do is this. We take over the other 12 hours of the day. We never touch a company device, company server, company email. We never ever set foot inside the company. We have no data risk whatsoever to the company because we have none of their data. We're keenly focused on the executive, their family, and all their personal devices, all their personal addresses, phone numbers, the data broker, all of that information externally, and all their personal homes. Let us secure that. What I hear from CISOs each and every day and from other partners we have is, man, this is a pain. I don't want to be on the phone with the CEO's husband or wife. I don't want to be on the phone with the CFO's significant other. It's not a good position to be in. And I don't want my team's time being wasted in an environment we have no control over, no controls in, and don't really want to see any of that personal information whatsoever. We want to protect their privacy. We want to reduce our risk. We don't want to have the pain of handling it, and we don't want to have the expense of hiring 5, 10, 20 people to run round-the-clock shifts to go monitor our executives. And that's where Black Cloak comes in. And, and Chris, I mean, yeah, hopefully nobody has information out there that they don't want out public. But the reality is <laughs> it's out there. I mean, you, you know Marco's MySpace password i, think. <laughs> I remember that yeah <laughs> so i got it back by the way you know, I'm, I'm reprofiling so stay that's tuned. right so i guess my point is that the company doesn't want certain people in their data space but the reality is their executives and high profile uh, leaders have their information out in the public through their home network and if you can get at it, so can the bad actors, right? So the, so can the cyber criminals. Um, yeah. So talk to me a little bit about that. And, and because it's not just breaching a system, which again, if there are little, little to no protections, that's one thing, but there's phishing and business email compromise and a bunch of other things that uses information that's public, right? Yeah. So when you think about it, the executives are out there and they're in public purview. They're supposed to be, that's what they're paid for. Same thing with the board and some of the other executive team leaders. Um, those individuals have an attack surface that is massively large. People know what address they have, what their cell phone is, what their home phone is, what their email address is. You can't remove it 100%, right? Nothing's 100%. But you can greatly reduce it so you mitigate some of the risks. But because of that, it means that their devices, it means that their personal email that you might be able to you know, get to and send a phishing email to or their personal cell phone you send a personal uh, phishing message, it means that you can reach out and touch them and cause real world harm on those devices. It might be a financial risk to them. It might be a you know extortion or a ransomware risk to them. It might be that they actually compromise those devices to get into the company. Um, so any one of those things are issues or a reputational risk. I'll give you, let me give you two salient points. Twilio and Uber, right? Just the summer, right? August and September, hacks occurred and they happened because the cyber criminals targeted the personal cell phone number in Uber and Twilio, and in one, they targeted the personal email addresses of uh, key employees at those companies. They sent them a flood of, hey, you have to go ahead and verify dual factor, verify dual factor, verify dual factor, just kept on flooding them. At some point in time, some employees clicked on the dual factor verification. They already had their username and password from Deep Web, Dark Web, and it enhanced it. And so as a result, the cyber criminals were able to sign in as an actual employee, that employee that they took over, and get into and across the entire environment. Probably a number of controls on the inside that didn't work as effectively or as well planned because they basically got access to everything, but it was a target the soft underbelly of the company, which is them in their personal life and get in. And as Danny said earlier, with the last pass breach, I mean, one of four key individuals, a wide open, right, unpatched uh, uh, server, Plex server running on a computer, and you get the computer, you get the key logger on the computer, you have the corporate credentials, you then go ahead and, and transfer on in into the company. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, it's a law of lowest common denominators, right? Really is. You know, I was just listening a couple of, uh, of news where now today everybody's talking about faking voice. 
so that you get to the next level of social engineering. And this was this professor who says spent like eight bucks and maybe like 10 minutes to they, to do an entire different persona, voice, and impersonation. So it makes me think like, Daniel, um, we talk about the future is now, but then there is the real, you know, the real future, the one that still has to happen. How how's things moving with all this acceleration of AI and, and maybe expanding even the threat landscape, not just because it's at home, but because we don't even know where the stuff is going. So anything that you can, you know, that you see happening now, you can predict. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously what we saw with the, the you know, police of chat GPT um, really kind of exposed the masses to the capabilities of AI um, and really brought it out to the world. The, 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 ability to do deep fakes and create what really realistic looking content, both from a voice perspective, but also from a visual perspective is going to completely change the game. Uh, and not only that is the ability to have AI or a solution like chat GPT generate phishing emails um, and generate really realistic looking password reset emails. And th you know, that's going to completely change the game. And the, the, the kind of the, the funny, interesting answer, and solution to it is probably going to be AI on the other end, uh, as we're going to see more defensive tools go into place to detect what AI on one end has generated to prevent AI from, you know, passing a filter on the other end. So some of the things that you can do now, I think, obviously, is some of the stuff that's been around for a while. Pin verifications, callbacks, everyone knows that you can spoof caller ID and call in. So instead of, you know, accepting someone calling in and saying, hey, it's so-and-so, you know, you say, okay, let me call back at the number we have on file for you and then validate them via um, some type of challenge response code that, you know, doesn't just rely on their voice uh, or them calling in and you trusting the caller ID number. So th there's a number of kind of old school methods that you can use to, to still, you know, validate someone in that specific model. And what's, what's super cool about this, and I, I totally agree with Danny, what's super cool about this, especially as it relates to like, let's just say voices and voice recording, out of every single person at your company, the key people are going to be your executives. And guess what? You can't stop them from talking. Every publicly traded company is going to have the quarterly earnings calls. You literally have the general counsel, the CEO, the CFO, the who's who, the most important people as a part of the executive team are always going to be on there. You can't tell them. Don't talk, don't this, don't that. I saw a whole bunch of advice and guidance that says, don't do anything in public. How are you going to have that happen? Yeah, right, not, don't go on a podcast. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just <laughs> not going to happen. It isn't going to happen. It's something that you have to go, you got to harden the human, you got to put in defensive measures, but you have to proactively know it's going to be there and get ahead of it. I totally agree with what Danny says, but it's just some of the some of the uh, you know, the controls around this are, are laughable. I mean, you, 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 you have to get out there as an executive. You have to get a salesperson that can't sell. I mean, uh. So tell, tell me, and maybe I don't know if, if both of you have uh, something to contribute to this question, but that the conversations you're having with organizations. Um, I mean, so you're, you're talking about bringing in a service to help them look externally at the risk that they have through their, through some of their uh, uh, high net worth employees and executives and things like that. How, how do those conversations go, Chris? I mean, who are you speaking to and, and kind of where does this fit into their, uh, overall program and then maybe Daniel you can kind of speak to well, how does that fit into maybe security management and security operations wherever those connections are made so I mean when we take a look at things overall right digital executive protection is executive protection but it's the ones and zeros of it right so there's already models for it when we're inside talking to folks at companies, we might be talking on the physical security side, the digital security side of it. We may be talking with the general counsel, HR. We may be talking with the CEO directly because they are the ones that are being impacted the most by it. Um, it's one of those things where the resounding call is a, we don't want to do this ourselves. We don't want to get involved in this. We want it. We recognize and realize it's a problem. We don't have faith and confidence necessarily in terms of, the degree to which the executives, board members, you know, all of these folks that are higher profile can protect themselves. And we want that risk reduced because we don't want to own it. And we also don't want to have a whole separate arm 
that's just operating and watching and minding and binding there. That's not from a privacy perspective, something that is part of their values is what we're hearing. And it's most certainly not part of ours. And so that's how a lot of the conversations start. And, and once you get to the, what do you do? And more importantly, what don't you do? How you don't right, harness any of their information, your remaining privacy secure and privacy agnostic and really shrinking that totally. I mean, those are conversations that they love, love to hear. And at the end of the day, that's fine. It's, it, it's a partnership. Like, yeah, we're tech enabled service. We're a platform, we're SaaS, all the rest. But at the end of the day, we're a relationship. We have a relationship with the CISA, with the champion, with the executives, with the EAs. Danny and Danny's team has a relationship with all of those champions. They can call us, have meetings with us any day that they want to. We are their partner. If they have an M&A that they're going to do, we want them to talk to us and they all talk to Danny. When they have a, a, a riff that may happen, unfortunately, we want them to talk to Danny ahead of time so we can turn up our defense systems against the board and the executive team, and the HR folks and leaders and stuff like that. We are a partner. We're a relationship person. We're a guide to the company and to that CISO. And that is so critically important. Sometimes beneath the tech, it can get lost. But at the end of the day, we're a relationship company. Yeah, and I think to, to capitalize on that, one of the, you know, I, I'm in a, a number of conversations and calls with the, the CISOs and the security leaders of the organizations. And, you know, one of the common comments that I hear is, you know, I have a trained staff. We've trained this InfoSec team on our equipment, on our technology. And to my point earlier is we don't know what's at our, at, at our employees' homes, our senior leadership team's homes, and nor, nor do we necessarily want them to be trained on those toolings. We've brought them in and trained them on, you know, you know, our specific EDR, our specific platforms. You know, they may be Active Directory joined Windows computers with, you know, CrowdStrike running on them and Cisco, you know, networking equipment. And then when you introduce a completely different home network with completely different technology, the team's not trained on that. So, you know, A, do you want your team exposed to the privacy risks of your employees and their home networks and the different devices that may be there and the things that may be on them? And B, do you want them, you know, make, taking the risk on equipment they may not be trained on or, or, or technology they may not know anything about? Yeah, and to that point, Chris, um, the kind of there, there's the technology piece and and understanding how that works, but there's also the behavior, right? People will work a certain way in the office. They do completely different things at home. Um, they're not being watched, right? So they, they do whatever they want. They, they fix their own computers. They, they set up their own networks. They, so the, the behaviors are different as well. I don't know if that, that plays a role. And uh, I mean, companies don't want to see what somebody's looking at at home, right? Yeah, I mean, what's most interesting there on the behavior side is this, is that what we see across every single sector, and we have people in the financial sector, healthcare, retailer, defense, you know, we got one of everything out there, you know, energy, I mean, one of everything. What we see is the behavior of executives, executive teams, board of directors, and those ELT teams, they all behave similarly. It doesn't matter whether you're the CEO of an energy company or CEO of a financial company. And the biggest behavior we see is they just don't have time for it. They are literally doing everything under the sun that they can, pouring their heart and soul and energy into the company and into making it better and all the rest. They're always on. They're never off. There's never a second gear uh, or lower gear, I should say. And so their, their behaviors are very, very much solidified on a, we don't have time to mind and bind this. We just want to make sure it's done. We want to work with you to make sure it's done. <clears throat> we want to make sure there's no friction in it. And as a result, we know we can get that reliance on a better state of cybersecurity but, um, but, you know, they always want to learn a little bit more and all the rest of their interest in that. But everyone starts out from that same grouping of the, just the time element that it would take and be required to actually do this themselves. They just don't have it. And so it's a little bit of a breath of fresh air. And the nice thing is this, is that usually what they're used to in terms of pure cybersecurity, it's going to be lots of high and controls, lot, you know, sometimes more friction, more pain and all the rest in different policies. And in their personal life, that's not what they want. What they just want to know is that they're safe and protected and at the same time can do exactly what they want to do, how they want to do it. And remember, it's not just they themselves so that their entire family can do it. And it's super important as a, as a part of our mission 
and a part of what we actually deliver each and every day. Our team is just, you know, second to none, second to none. And it, it, kept, it comes in mind the idea of concierge, right? I mean, you, you, you're you used to be treated in a certain way, but not just because you're special. It's because, again, you're busy, you can afford it, obviously, and you, you have to worry about other things, but your family, it's you can pay the consequences of it. So I, I like this idea that the company can just not do that. It's two different entities. I mean, it's uh, it's clear to me. But I do have a question for you. So my employee's home has been breached. Now what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your employee's home. It. Yeah, you know, you know what's so, you know what's so interesting about that is, uh, uh, you know, look, uh, whenever the RSA submissions were due, I, I don't know, you know, July, whatever it was, um, you know, we submitted for, uh, uh, you know, this year, uh, you know, so privileged to to be able to speak again, but uh, uh, you know, we submitted for, you know, your employees a breach, a home has been breached. Now what? Um, you know, a good whatever six, seven months before, three months before to, to Uber and Twilio, and seven months or whatever it was before uh, LastPass. Uh, yeah, we're going to do a, uh, uh, I'm joined by my good friend, Jim Shreve. We're going to do a two-hour learning lab, right? Two-hour learning lab. Uh, we do these each year on scenarios so that we can prepare the next people coming up. CISOs, deputy CISOs, directors of security operations, threat intel teams, analysts, compliance people, lawyers. Everyone is welcome. We grab you into a room. We have really, really great scenario this year. We always put in our few little favorite jokes in terms of the company names there, little parodies going on. Um, but we're going to put you in front of a live, real-time, uh, uh, you know, compromise around an employee's home being compromised. Literally, it's it's LastPass written seven months, eight months before LastPass, and we're going to walk you through the scenario, break you up into groups, assign people different roles. You might get to be a lawyer, you might get to be a security person, you might get to be a CEO, and uh, really fun, engaging. I think we're limited. I think we close the room at like 200 people, is what I think we do. And uh, we got two different stages to it. And it's a lot of fun. If you want something that is really exciting, really fun, uh, we're Wednesday of uh, RSA, uh, 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning over in Moscone. And uh, it's just going to be a lot of fun. You are going to work, right? We're not, people that aren't, people don't come to the session that want to check email. You're going to be there. You're going to be working, collaborating. And what's cool is, is that you actually take away the real plans for what you want to do next in a week, in a month, in a quarter, in a half a year, and in a year in terms of what you need to do. And you've collaborated with people that you wouldn't have normally met. And so you can also inside your group, like business cards are getting exchanged left and right there amongst the tables. People with different things. Oh, that was a good idea. Hey, you have a great mind in terms of this. Wow, the way you look at compliance or security or architecture, whatever is great. And it's really, really kind of a, quite honestly, an intensive two-hour team building exercise and uh, it's, it's Chatham House rules. So um, it's really great time uh, and effort. Um, oh, we love it. We're looking forward to it. We hope we, I mean, we hope all your, we hope the listeners will come. We hope the room will be packed. Usually each year we get a line outside the door, um, but it is, uh, it's really intense and fun. You know, I've always dreamed about it. Dungeon, <laughs> dungeon and dragons of cybersecurity. That sounds like, <laughs> sounds fantastic. Wow. Exactly. Almost... If you want to think about it that way, Marco, is great. <laughs> yes. Dungeon, we, do, we run the RSA Dungeons and Dragons uh, show there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to go to Dan and maybe he can, he can bring in some, uh, some uh, Dungeons and Dragons lingo. But I mean, <laughs> as Chris was describing that, I, I was picturing a tabletop exercise. You even use the word table, right? Um, this is so different from a traditional security management, security operations, security response tabletop, right? That most companies would deal with. What What are some of those? I don't know if you can highlight some of the, the main differences there, what people have to talk about and think about and who, who they have to talk with and talk about with them. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we actually, um, you know, offer when we do talk to the CISOs is we could, we could come in and actually assist with the C with the tabletops, part of the SOC two type two compliance and other compliances that, that are, uh, are required to do, you know, kind of thought exercises and tabletop exercises. And, and, you know, one of them is kind of a scenario where you have your employees and your high access employees. We put it out there on LinkedIn. We put it out there on, the about us page, right? So what the attackers are doing is they're gaining, the gain, learning who the employees are, or if a new employee starts, then going to the data broker sites, pulling all the data broker information about that individual, getting their personal email addresses. Usually their corporate email addresses don't have as many data breaches, but their 
personal email addresses may have. And then they're able to get passwords associated with their personal email addresses and then pivot those into, say, their new corporate email address, their VPN login, their Office 365 login. So we can do a table exercise where we say, you know, we have a high access employee whose personal AOL.com email is in a data broker site. And then it's also on a dark website with exposed passwords. What do we do? Right. What is, what's the what's the exercise here? Um, it's actually led to a breach or, you know, it could potentially be an IP address that was identified on one of the dark websites um, as part of a different breach. And it allowed the attacker to then gain access into their home network because they were using the same password on uh, a, a VPN or a Plex media server. So we can do different table talks exercises on how attackers are, are pivoting through these different types of, you know, OSINT available materials to gain access into the networks. So it makes me think something, uh, and we know, I mean, cybersecurity, we started thinking it's all technology and then we figure out it's all the humans and technology, kind of. And when I think I working in the homes and again, you know, all the things you said, Chris, it's uh, how much do you have to adapt the relationship that is normally the business relationship with these companies when you're dealing with the individual, the family. I mean, is it hard to get them to all cooperate? I mean, are you, you know, I mean, is it a struggle? Is that the kids, they try not to do things? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good question. Um, you know, the, the, when I said relationships early on, I really did mean it. It's like literally right from the start as part of Black Cloak. We have a kickoff call with that champion, that CISO, their team, Danny, the director of our security threat operations center, salespeople, everyone is around us, Rose, our customer uh, experience officer. And we all are there on our side with them talking what things are happening in your area, what things are important to us, making sure that we're making a unique experience that is deliverable to their unique executives. So we know about their executives beforehand. So we actually craft a plan together to go ahead and onboard their executives. It might be going through their EAs. It might be these executive first, these second, these third, a whole process there. A lot of what companies actually do is they end up protecting the entire family because if, right, if you have one sick kid in the household, everyone else is going to get sick. Same thing if you have one virus laden, malware laden computer, well, guess what? You're probably going to have an issue on the other computers and on the network. And so, Right there, the key thing is that as part of our onboarding, we actually have a 15-minute executive meeting with those executives. Sometimes it has to be two meetings because they're busy, they're global, they're traveling around the world. But we'll actually go ahead and talk to them about who we are, what we do, what we don't do, what information we don't share, what information we don't collect, and we gain their trust, their peace of mind. And then from there, it's pretty easy in terms of the significant other and the kids. Kids are actually pretty darn quick. Uh, they come on board super fast. And it's always that aha moment when you get everyone around the table talking together. We'll onboard people one by one. We'll onboard the entire family together. It really depends on that relationship with the CISO and knowing their executive team and helping us make sure that the onboarding process goes smoothly. There are no onboardings that are the same as the next one. Everything is handcrafted for that environment, for those people down to literally each individual person. Are they technologically savvy? Do they have certain weak points, strong points, um, all the rest? Uh, Dan, Danny's, Danny's team and, and Ingrid Gliatone, our chief experience officer, uh, they just, you know, just top notch in this area and, and our corporate account manager as well, just top notch. And is there, I don't know, different environments, uh, more difficult, different industry executives, different and and i guess what i'm really thinking is more of a mindset uh there yes there's a technical piece there but do most or what, what's kind of the ratio of i know i have a problem or i think i might have a problem or not me i don't have any problems <laughs> and then and for those how how surprised are they when they find out that that they do But they, yeah, I don't know. And Danny, maybe you could go back and forth with me on this a little bit. But I mean, I would say this is that by and large, all the sectors behave the same, right? Executives behave very much similarly. I would say more so, you know, general counsel behave in the same manner. CFOs behave in the same manner. So there's more parity among kind of the class of your job role, so to speak, uh, in terms of uh, how you actually behave. 
Um, uh, within that subset, uh, you know, what's, what's really nice about what we do is we start with our intelligence piece and our intelligence engine, gain their trust immediately. And so, um, you know, people aren't back on their heels. People are leaning in when they're working with that black cloak and we can show them and tell them what we can really do and immediately fix. And so, and so, it's got to be on, go beyond that risk assessment mentality of, oh, here are your risks or here's the bad stuff we found or that stuff doesn't play so well. What's more important and where you immediately gain the trust and it becomes a, wow, I didn't know I had that. Wow. I didn't know that my email had logins from you know Russia. Wow. I didn't know that there was a separate DNS entry on my computer and it wasn't me. Um, you know, these are the things that immediately gain their confidence. Um, and really show them the value early on. Uh, obviously, the CISO gets value, right? They're getting value. But but making sure the executives understand the value that they get is super important as well. I don't know, Danny. Yeah, yeah. I think that you, you have some of the you know, different types of individuals, right? So anyone who's ever been a victim of a cybercrime, whether they've had their email breached or, or, or some type of financial fraud, they, they usually get it right away. Uh, they understand the importance of cybersecurity. Um, for people who, who don't necessarily get it because they're not as technical or they've never experienced a type, any type of incident or event, um, you know, sometimes there, it's a little bit of a, um, you know, more tough, I won't really call it a sale, but it's a tougher explanation to say why they may be at risk. But usually once we meet with the team and we can show them the amount of data that's available out there, or even just show them some of the things like how much data, location data that your phone is sharing, and what's available just by showing them certain settings on the phone, um, lots of light bulbs go off, right? They're like, oh, wow, that I did not know that my um, phone could know this much about everywhere I went or it was tracking all my favorite locations. Uh, another example of that is a lot of people don't understand how important it is to secure their mobile carrier, right? So their Verizon login, their AT&T login. Um, you know, who cares if they can access my Verizon account? Well, then you show them what's available if someone gets access to your Verizon account. Everyone you've talked to, all your call logs, all your text logs, if it's been over SMS, the ability to port out your phone number, the ability to do a SIM swap. Once you explain that to them and show that to them while you're securing the account with them, um, it really changes their outlook and how they realize that this stuff is much more important and much easier to attack than what they thought it was. And I want, I want to key in on a word Danny said. It was really short word, four letters, show. Mm. can't tell, right? right? Executives don't want to be told. They are smart individuals that are right, exceedingly smart in what they're doing, capable, accomplished, all the rest. When you're able to bring them in so that everyone's on the same side of the table and able to show them the risk, show them the value, show them the harm, that's when the magic happens. That's when you gain their confidence. That's when you become their trusted concierge. It's that show, and it's got to be that way. And so speaking of that and, and looking at the different roles that, that both of you kind of touched on, and I'm going back to your session at, at RSA, Chris, um, what kind of folks do you really want in that, in that session? The 200 people there, who, who do you want? And you want the legal and the ops and the HR, and who, who do you think you can get, and, and why does that matter to have a mix? Yeah, uh, what we want are, I mean, first and foremost, we want people that are wide awake at 8.30 a.m. with all the alcohol out of their system. Uh, that, that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, we want people that are interested in the topic that actually say, hey, <laughs> you know, this is an interesting topic. It just so happens that a few weeks ago, we read a story from about last fest where this is true and it's happening. Maybe I should update my risk registry. Maybe I should come think about this differently. Maybe I should engage in a two-hour tabletop learning lab session where we actually go through a real scenario and learn something, bring something back, all the rest. Quite honestly, we want some people from cybersecurity in there. We want some people on the infrastructure side. We want some people from compliance, from legal. We want people across all different spans. We want people at all different uh, uh, kind of, uh, at not, not ages, but all different types of levels of sophistication and expertise and then places in their career. We And we actually do a really good job of making sure that room is always, always diverse. So we want people that are genuinely interested in this topic and bringing something back special to their organization saying, hey, have you thought about this? Mm -hmm. um, last year, last year we did a cybersecurity Jenga one, uh, or, or a cybersecurity Jenga, and we did third party uh, uh, um, supplier uh, risk. And this was actually before uh, the third party supplier uh, global supply chain uh, 
uh, hacks that actually happened. Once again, kind of predicting the future. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember it back. It was back in, uh, you remember when the guy landed the drone on the White House lawn? We actually had put in for the speech and it was two weeks before RSA. We did a, hey, drone legal and security issues. And then the guy lands the drone on the front lawn of the White House. Uh, you know, packed audience, packed audience. Um, so we do a really good job of that. We just want people that are there that are excited, energetic, want to learn something new, want to collaborate. This is a this is a laptops down, email down, get into the fray, learn something, debate, discuss. You know, uh, we just want people that are energized about the topic. Which you would hope that if people are up at 830 at RSA, they are interested in the topic to start with. Plus, you predict the future, so I'm expecting you given lottery ticket numbers. So they can win. <laughs> well, I I don't I don't know. Give no, it a go. If we Learn. if I if we actually think we're if I think I'm gonna be good at that, <laughs> I, I might I might keep that one to myself. We'll share the cybersecurity knowledge. I might keep that one to myself. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, well if you can repeat the future, you may as well. There you go. You can, and you can use it and then share it and let somebody else reuse it. <laughs> uh, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, just think if you go to this session, you get to meet Danny. Right, I'm assuming Danny's going to be there. Oh, we we we'll, we'll have a we'll have a bunch of people there from Black Cloak. Uh, we'll have <laughs> a bunch of people there from Black Cloak, so there'll be a good number of people to meet. But um, uh, you know, in and around RSA conference, uh, my friend J Jim Shreve from Thompson Coburn will be there. He and I partner. We do these together in a in a uh, you know non-solicitous fashion. We're always there, you know, kind of getting ahead of the curve. What is late breaking? What is new? What is something that actually is going to be something you haven't heard before. And like I said, we've been pretty darn successful on those topics that, that just somehow, you know, knock on wood, uh, seem to come to the forefront. Yep. Super cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Glad. Uh, I'm glad you got us another spot for, for doing this, uh, this, this tabletop. I know they're always a huge success in your sessions as well. Um, we've had the privilege of talking to you, uh, over the years about the different topics you've, you've, uh, brought to bear and, I mean, always educational, always informational, and uh, most importantly, actionable, right? Uh, so Chris and Danny, it's great to have you on. Uh, there'll be links in the notes to connect with both of you, a uh, link to your session at RSA conference, link to Black Cloak, so if those who can't make it uh, can still, uh, still find you and all the good stuff that you're doing at Black Cloak to help secure the executive uh, at home. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. It's always, always good to see you, Sean. Always good to see you, Marco. And I'm glad Danny got to experience uh, some of this uh, here with us today. Uh, just, you know, the team's phenomenal and knocking them dead. Absolutely. Another story with you guys uh, with Black Clock. So we are very excited. And uh, Sean, uh, this is part of our conference coverage. So, we, you know, we, we encourage everybody to check out what's going on. A lot of new things. We had a conversation with... Uh, some of the organizer it's already up on the website so you can check it out and get a preview of what's going to happen uh this year and yep. uh and of course meet chris meet daniel uh meet sean the theme is ne better never together. mind me i'm not never mind you no, no, mind i'm you. not better much together. to meet better together this year is the, is the theme so exactly oh, yeah. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll follow Absolutely. that for sure. all right thanks everybody for listening and uh we'll see you online or in san francisco wherever you might be. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and the story made you think, then share itsbmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.